Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we are going to be podcasting on a topic that everybody is talking about this week. What is our topic, Landon? The Kirkland Temple sale. That's right. And we are going to delve into triumph or tragedy of this event because this happened at the beginning of the week and every day new things are unfolding as far as how people feel, their reactions on all sides of this. So we thought we would kind of dive in and just give an overview and actually answer some questions that we ourselves had. And we thought that our viewers and listeners might also be curious about because this is a pretty big deal, isn't it? Yeah, this is a, a huge deal. Uh, the Kirkland Temple's always been owned by the, when I was growing up, the reorganized church, now called the Community of Christ. So uh, for the church to be able to purchase this and bring it under their uh, history, a historical department, however you want to say it, is is a pretty big portfolio. deal. Portfolio. You know, I, I would portfolio. use the word portfolio, yes, to yes. bring it into their portfolio. <laughs> So exactly. There's a lot to cover here. And I know a lot of wonderful podcasters have covered this, um, but we're going to talk about a few things with a fresh new spin and kind of go into some areas that maybe not everybody has covered. So the most important thing to cover is our next slide. And OK, you you know what we're saying here. So I have heard so many people uh, say and or write um, Kirkland Temple. This is not the Kirkland Temple. What is the Kirkland Temple, Land? <laughs> that would be the place you love to go and worship, and that's Costco. <laughs> I do. I do. I'm in a, a regular attender of the Kirkland Temple, which is Costco. I have to say, I love it. <laughs> so what we're talking about tonight is the Kirtland Temple. So just to make that clear. All right. Uh, why don't you read this, Landon? This is just taken um, out of the Tribune. This all broke on Tuesday. It was Tuesday, right? It wasn't yesterday. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It's been a blur. And let's just give a brief overview of exactly what we're talking about. The big news with the Kirtland Temple. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has bought a cherished piece of its history, the Kirtland Temple. On Tuesday afternoon, the Salt Lake City-based faith announced the purchase of the valuable Ohio property, the first temple built by the followers of church founder Joseph Smith. The faith also acquired a number of historical documents along with historic sites in Nauvoo, Illinois, from the Independence, Missouri-based Community of Christ. That's exactly right. So as Landon said before, the Community of Christ, formerly known as the reorganized um, Church of Latter-day Saints, um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I should say, um, has owned this temple for quite a long time. And all of a sudden, the big news broke that the LDS Church has purchased it. Let's look at our next slide. So the first question, I think a lot of people may not be completely aware. I'm always surprised by this. I was just talking to a group last week who didn't understand that the community of Christ used to be the RLDS, and that it was the church that Emma and Joseph's son, Joseph Smith III, had started um, back in the 1800s. So um, let's read a little blur very quickly. And this picture right here is their temple, isn't it, Landon? Have you ever been there? Have you ever seen yeah. this? Yeah, I've been there. It's in, in This is in Independence, mm -hmm. uh, Missouri, not uh, Kirtland. Correct. Uh, but this is the Community of Christ Temple. Uh, that's built right next to the temple lot uh, that's been dedicated uh, or was dedicated for the building of a temple in Zion. That's right. And we will talk about the temple lot a little bit later, because that, I think, is almost another important part of the story. Um, so the Community of Christ, known from 1872 to 2001 as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the RLDS, is an American-based international church and is the second largest denomination in the Latter-day Saint movement. That's important to know. Uh, what's the third largest, Landon? Do you remember? Uh, I'm guessing the FLDS. Uh, no, I think it's the Bickertonites, actually. Are they bigger than? Okay. Uh, 
think I, I remember that I remember Steve Pinecker, who knows everything said that it's uh, the community of Christ. And then the bicker tonight is the third, but you know what? Fact check us. Let's find this out. So um, the church reports 250,000 members in 1100 congregations in 59 countries. The church traces its roots to Emma Smith and Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith, the third, who formally accepted leadership of the church in 1860. So this is a whole history that I would say not a lot of, you know, <laughs> active Latter-day Saint may be fully aware, right? They may be sort of aware of this history, but not fully aware. Do you agree with that? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, you have to know. I didn't realize until I'd gone to Nauvoo uh, and, and was going through that, that I was told that Emma, you know, remarried and, and that's where she lived. And I was going... Why didn't Emma go with Brigham Young? I always thought, you know, yeah. you heard the love story of Joseph and Emma, and I assumed that she was with the church all the way in. It turns out her and Brigham Young absolutely hated each other. They despised each other. Uh, lots of fights between them. Uh, he calls her, uh, you know, some really awful names, and she returns those. So there was definitely a, a break when uh, the Brighamites left. Uh, but Emma stayed in Nauvoo, and... Uh, that's where a lot of the uh, church artifacts and then uh, the church, the reorganized church started and took over. And then uh, in 1860, they had uh, Joseph Smith, the third Joseph Smith's son accepted the leadership. So he, they didn't start it, but they uh, took leadership of it. Exactly. Because I don't feel a lot of people even realize what the succession crisis meant. There were many other claims on the leadership of the church. Sidney Rigdon, he had a very strong claim. Um, the Strangites were another group. There were lots of people that said, no, I think I'm supposed to be the leader because interestingly, uh, Joseph Smith didn't make any kind of plan for that. And God didn't tell Joseph what to do. So it was really kind of a hot mess back then. Um, let's go to our next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is an interesting question that I had. As soon as I heard the news, I thought, okay, so if you follow the news of the community of Christ, their former prophet, President Stephen M. Vesey, um, had decided to step away because of health reasons. And a new president had been called um, Stacey D. Crown. So I thought, because sometimes I look at the Mormon church and I think when there's sort of a power vacuum at the top, like maybe the prophet is ill, maybe he's completely infirm. Like I think of Benson, I think of Monson at the end. And then you have some of the apostles that are kind of jockeying around, maybe with agendas. I would call that a power vacuum. And haven't you noticed, Landon, that sometimes decisions are made or things happen in this void of strong leadership at the top? Like I would think of the November 15th, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of happened in that situation. So I was curious, you know, did this sale happen because of a power vacuum at the top? So I reached out to somebody who's in the know in the community of Christ, somebody who's a very prominent member. And uh, the first thing that I talked about with this person is his incredible anguish. And so by saying anguish, you probably know who I'm talking about overhearing this decision and what had happened, um, just devastation. And I asked him the question, how did this decision even happen? What happened? And he told me the current president, Stephen M. Vesey, is in charge of the church. Cause that was my first question. Um, Stacy is not going to be ratified into 2025. So, you know, what is this kind of gray area that's happening right now in their church? Um, however, he and the incoming president and that's Stacy D. Cron are both in the first presidency. So they're both there working together, which made the decision. The first presidency made the decision to sell along with the presiding Bishop Rick and the council of the 12. So both of them are part of the decision, but the current president, and that's the sitting president who has not yet stepped completely away, would have made the final decision. So I guess my guess about, did this just kind of happen? Did it slip through? That doesn't seem to be true, does it? Seems like it was a it was a decision that they all made. No, I read on the, uh, on the uh, Community of Christ webpage, they actually mentioned who was in on the decision. And it was the the two first presidencies mm -hmm. that you know the two people coming on their presiding bishopric, uh, their twelve apostles, their uh, presiding elder, the presiding seventy. They listed quite a few people who were uh, in the know. So it was their entire leadership that made this decision. This, uh, you know, you have to wonder. Wow, they've sold their 
you know, they basically sold what makes them who they are. They're the second largest uh, church in the restoration movement. And they've always had a place at the table because they own these properties. Uh, so they've always had a place at the table in the restoration discussion because they've owned so many of the documents and the different uh, things. And they certainly had a strong claim with uh, Joseph Smith uh, and his son, uh, Joseph Smith's son and wife, you know, being a part of the yeah. uh, organization of the church. So uh, this should not, this, this didn't come as a surprise to me from a financial standpoint. I actually uh, was traveling on business uh, to Kansas City, uh, got on an airplane, and uh, the guy who I was sitting next to was uh, from the Community of Christ. Must have been someone in the upper leadership. Uh, I was sitting there reading my book, and he opened up a folder and in that folder, it was the it said the community of Christ. That's how I knew he was someone from the community of Christ. <laughs> you were kind and, of looking over. Yeah, and well, he he started reading. He was highlighting, and I kind of went hmm, community of Christ. So I kind of you know looked over, and the thing he was highlighting was that the church was in financial trouble and that they were going to have to cut back a lot of things. And this was probably four years ago. Oh, so wow. I don't think that the church, uh, the community of Christ, is in great financial. Uh, condition. And as a result, they have to make a decision whether they're going to continue to operate for many years in the future, or if they're going to, uh, you know, continue on with these properties that probably cost money for upkeep. Yeah. So this probably does two things that, you know, offsets the cost to upkeep the properties, uh, as well as puts money in their coffers so that they can continue as a church. Uh, the thing I think it really hurts is it, it kind of makes them irrelevant um, in the area that they're in now. Uh, you know, a, a lot of XLDS people, uh, when they leave the, the mainstream church, kind of look at the community of Christ and say, well, I still have this restoration view or this restoration yeah. belief. I don't think that the Brighamite church, uh, I think they've lost their way. And so they look here and a lot of people I know go here and it's kind of a soft landing for people who are leaving the uh, the mainstream church and they go to to the community of Christ. And now they've pretty much separated themselves. And right now they're involved in a lot of conferences uh, mm -hmm. and, and different things. They're invited to the table and they have a seat at the table because they have the documents and they have the temple the sites. Yeah. They have the artifacts. Well, they just sold a large portion of those artifacts and a large portion of the, the documents that they've had uh, that make them relevant in the restoration movement. So they, to me, they kind of went from being the second largest restoration church, church of the restoration, to becoming just a small, regular Christian church, because they basically, it's almost as if they've divorced themselves from their history. These are the important artifacts. These are where a lot of the major things from the restoration occurred, and they owned it, and now they don't. They, they've they sold it off. Hmm. Yeah, and I've heard some people speculate that that is by design, that they are removing themselves from that history and moving forward, and that all of this, the decision, the money, the kind of putting that in the past um, is a decision for the future, that it was, it was very much intentional. So again, everybody's kind of discussing what does this mean? What will this mean? Does it change their identity or does it not change their identity? And I do know there was speculation. It's kind of interesting how this all happened. Even there was a lot of speculation that this announcement of acquiring the Kirtland Temple was going to be made at the upcoming general conference. It's a month away. And can you imagine if this had been announced, like say the last session, I mean, you would have hear, heard the cheering, right? But interestingly, there was somebody else who was bidding on it, who, um, you know, our, our friend that we know, John, and um, he was bidding on the temple and he kind of broke the story because <laughs> he heard rumblings that it was going to happen. And I think he kind of thought, I'm going to get this out there. Steve Pinecker then picked it up. So very quickly, the news started to spread. And then almost instantly, there was a press release. So I feel like the church knew this was a possibility that it might leak out, but I still feel like they probably wanted to announce it at conference. 
And they probably wanted to use it as an example of, do you remember that statement? I think two conferences ago, what was it exactly? Now is the day of my ultimate, no, that's Star Wars. Anyway, yeah. there was some, what yeah, was that, that announcement? That there would be uh, in this near future, miracles yes. uh, would happen. And and uh, I'm sure they were gonna tout this as the miracle. I, I don't yeah. know how a property real estate investment is a miracle. <laughs> it, but the miracle is, is that, Christianity across America is waning and falling. The community of Christ has made themselves uh, a very Christian organization. They've yeah. moved away from the restorationism. And just like everybody else, they're losing members and they don't have a $100 billion slush fund uh, to keep them alive. Uh, and so as a result, uh, they had to make a decision and they have made the decision. Uh, it's it, uh, it it must have been very bitter uh, yes. to have to make a decision to sell off the, the thing that uh, kind of made them relevant. I think I had no idea who they were uh, until I visited Nauvoo and they were, you know, they owned so many of the properties there that you went, oh, who are these people, you know? Right. And so you learned about them at this point. Uh, they no longer will. I think the church, how much did they spend? 192? 2.5. Yeah. 192.5 million dollars. And uh, I, I think we should make it perfectly clear. The church did not spend 192 million dollars to buy uh, a temple or to buy the Kirtland Temple. They spent 192 million dollars to own the narrative so that yeah. they can now tell what happened there. Uh, and you know as well as I do, that they will now put missionaries there who will tell this wonderful story of yeah. the restoration and all the wonderful things that happened in the Kirtland Temple. Uh, but we we'll, we want to fact check some of that. We're going to look at some of that in today's <laughs> yep, episode. Yeah, we're going to delve into all that absolutely as we go forward. But I do know that this blindsided a lot of people in the community of Christ and just in other communities and everyone's still kind of grappling with what does this mean and so I think time will tell. I think this is this is just the beginning of the story. So, um, and I guess another thing we should kind of make clear, let's go to our next slide. We spent a lot of time on this slide, right? Okay. Um, there were some questions about what would happen to the temple right away. You know, will it become a temple temple, right? And no one can get inside. The church have assured, has assured us that it will not be converted into a dedicated temple, meaning that you would need a temple recommend and very few people could go inside. It's going to remain a building that people can, as you mentioned, take a tour through. It's going to close initially, and then it's going to open on March 25th, so just in a couple of weeks, for year-round free public tours. And I guess we should clarify, maybe for some of our viewers and listeners that are never Mormons, when you go to this site... Um, there are buildings already that are owned by the church and that are staffed by mostly senior couples and sister missionaries. And they do, you know, tell you what happened in each building and the significance. But interwoven with those buildings in the past, up until right now, have been buildings that are owned by the community of Christ. And they have their own tour guides and they're telling their own story of their history, um, which is a little bit different. Um, some might say maybe it's a more honest history. I had a friend who went through and they said, oh yeah, they took me over and said, this is where the Fanny Alder story happened. <laughs> you know? I don't think you're going to hear that. You're going to hear it from a community of Christ guide but you're probably not going to hear that story from a senior missionary couple because they probably don't even know about that story. So I think that's one of our questions. Will the narrative be changed when it comes to the locations, the buildings, the artifacts, you know, the documents? Will the narrative be tweaked a little bit? And I think that's what everybody's concerned about. And it should be noted that it was the community of Christ who insisted uh, as part of the sale that it had to remain open to the public at no cost. Uh, I think that was one of the conditions that they put on it. Uh, I don't believe for a minute that the church isn't going to somehow say this is a temple and they're going to try to convert it at some point in the future. Someday. But for now, they have to keep it that way. Uh, and and they will use it for the tours to try to get, you know, members to can or people yeah. who are not members to use it as a missionary tool and to reinforce the faith of those who are uh, actual members by telling uh, the, you know, official narrative of what happened 
uh, there. Correct. And, and we've been to enough historic sites that are manned by wonderful senior couples. And we've been to the church history museum and there definitely is a narrative, you know, and if you try to introduce some other ideas, like, well, I thought it was like this, they definitely have a script and they're there to give very faith promoting, faith affirming versions of things. For example, um, I think at the top of the temple, you know, where it says, and I think we have a slide later about this that, that we'll get to, you don't have to try to find it now, but you know, uh, erected by the church of the latter day saints, right? There's no Jesus Christ in it. And I don't know if the missionary couples will tell the story of how the church changed its name back and forth to avoid creditors. You know, they could say, well, that's not our church. We're the church of the latter day. I doubt we'll get that story. And, and I wonder if somebody were to ask, why did they abandon this beautiful building? I don't know if the senior couples would talk about the banking scandal and how so many of the saints left and Joseph was run out of town. I just, I don't think maybe that, I think that narrative may be sweetened a little or not, maybe not even mentioned at all you know? but i know the community of christ is very honest about it they point to the buildings here's where the anti-bank was they explain it because it's part of the history the good the bad the ugly it all happened and and they're comfortable sharing it i just don't know if the new stewards of the buildings are going to be comfortable sharing it so all right let's go to our next slide okay so we're going to talk a little bit about what else was purchased we'll just kind of go through this um, looks like, and we don't have to read everything. If, if everybody wants to pause the slide, they can take a look. Um, the cornerstone of the Nauvoo house, which was used to store the original Book of Mormon manuscript. So they got that, but I think the manuscript was kind of destroyed. It wasn't really watertight, was it? Well, it was, yeah, there was parts of it that, uh, yeah. and, and I believe the church bought the manuscript previously. Yes. So they yes. already owned the manuscript. Now they own the cornerstone. Yeah. Yeah. What else? The Joseph Smith Bible. Manuscripts of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, letters from Joseph to Emma. Those will be really interesting. Uh, but again, it raises the question, will these be available to people? Will these perhaps parts be cut out and scotch tape back in later? You know, I mean, there's concern because there's precedence for hiding things or putting things away that are maybe more of a confusing narrative. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you've got there a history of the church written by early Latter-day Saint John Whitmer. Mm -hmm. and I, I know there's a John Whitmer Society that does uh, has a historical society, and I I don't know <laughs> they they hold that I believe in Nauvoo or uh, mm -hmm. in these uh, areas, and uh, you know how I don't know how relevant that'll be if now that the documents are gone. Yeah. These are all questions. I guess we'll just see going forward. What else did they purchase? Um, looks like, let's go to the next slide. Like I said, we don't have to read every single thing. Um, oh, see, this to me is one of the more important ones. The caricatures, I can't even say it, caricatures document. Oh my goodness. Can you tell us what that is, Landon? Yeah, it's a document with the title characters, which may contain a sample of inscriptions from the gold plate smith said he used to translate the face signature scripture of the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is believed to be the, a copy of the characters that were taken to Professor Anton to verify that they are, uh, in fact, uh, you know, ancient uh, Reformed Egyptian, uh, which, as we all know the story, he confirmed that they were. Uh, anyone who looks at these can absolutely confirmed they are not exactly. <laughs> anything reform Egyptian. <laughs> uh, the story goes that they were uh, some of the different languages of the time, not, yeah. not Egyptian Greek, is what they some, yeah. said. Uh, so evidently they came from three different types of languages, which makes right. no sense that uh, you'd write in different languages. But anyway, these are supposed to be characters from the, the um, uh, Book of Mormon that were copied down and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, had Anton look at him. So yeah. uh, the the dangerous part of this one is if you bought the characters because you believe that it's an actual document, uh, then you're actually saying these are, that this is, in fact, what was shown to Professor Anton and that these are, in fact, uh, inscriptions from the uh, gold plates. And so uh, now they're open for... Uh, and inspection evaluation because the church had evidently has confirmed that the that they spent a lot of money to acquire this yep. so they must think it's uh 
that that it's uh, not a forgery. Yeah, no, this this will be interesting, and and hopefully again this won't disappear into the church vault, right? Or somewhere where we can't get any that mysterious F vault that we learned about. Remember, we talked to It'll somebody. It'll probably who, sit right next to the seer stone. Uh, it probably will. Which would be interesting. You should be able to take the seer stone and just uh, <laughs> go like that and get English translation for now, it. Now, that would be too simple. So no, that granite vault, as we understand it, is divided up into six different sections, A, B, C, D, E, F. And F apparently stands for first presidency and no one can get in. This is what someone told me. Who knows? So we'll see. Um, all right. Let's see what else. Uh, who knows what's in that vault? Maybe all of these artifacts will end up in that vault. Joseph Smith's writing desk. You can see that in the picture. Also, Sidney Rigdon's house and other homes of other church leaders. So this is a major purchase of holdings. This is this is not just one or two things. This is massive when you start going through the list. And even this list is kind of paraphrased. They want to own the entire history so they own the narrative nobody else gets to put any anything in or give another point of view and that's what the church is interested in is yep. limiting the other points of view and making sure that only their narrative is is what's told there yeah i know i made the joke that now they own everything they're going to make it into sort of a theme park or an amusement park maybe and you can go there and get your eliza r snow cone and you can walk down the street <laughs> and you can look at everything <laughs> It'll be a destination for It'll Mormon be a destination. families. Yeah. I will say, though, obviously, all the buildings will be kept up very well. And the grounds, the church does an amazing job. However, lots of times when they restore these buildings, some of the true character seems to be lost or perhaps put through a wood chipper. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> funny because happened everyone's to the saying, interior. Yeah, the yeah everyone's saying, oh, they'll preserve this well. And they do. There's a lot of historical sites that they preserve very well. Um you know, uh, but then they don't, th then they take the Salt Lake Temple and they take yeah. all the interior and they run it through. They don't want anyone to have any of it. So right. here they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars buying artifacts, uh, church artifacts, but right. they shred everything in the temple so nobody can have a church artifact or have any pieces well, of it. Yeah, and I think they're trying to get away from that frenzy to own a piece of the temple. You know, I understand that. But you look at what they did to the Salt Lake Temple on the outside, too. All the everything that made it interesting, I think, is going to be gone. I took a whole semester class about the temple architecture um, as part of my humanities degree. And I mean, it's Masonic, yes, but extremely interesting. And that's going to be gone now. Everything on the inside, the murals, everything's gone. And they were headed down to Manti to do the same thing. But the international art world said, no way. Petitions, great public outcry. And so the church backed off and instead had a, had a revelation to create the Ephraim temple instead. Now the Manti temple will be more of a historic temple. So again, maybe not thinking it through when they, in their treatment of, of, histor of history and historic artifacts, places, and documents. So we'll see. We'll hope for the best. All right, let's look at what else was purchased. And again, this is just kind of paraphrasing it. Um, the Smith family homestead, summer kitchen, the mansion house the red brick store, and the Nauvoo house. All of these should sound very familiar to everyone. Uh, we all know the different events that happened in most of these locations. And again, I think a lot of members of the church didn't realize if they haven't been out to the area that the church didn't already own them. But now you've been out there, Landon, and you've taken the various tours where you tour through and you get the LDS narrative and their tour guides, and then you get this, the community of Christ. And there's a difference, I think. What do you think about that? The biggest thing I saw, the biggest difference was I didn't feel like the reorganized church was trying to do missionary work uh, oh. there. They more or less just let you in and wandered and they, you know, like the red brick store, you could buy a, a reproduction first edition of the Book of Mormon, you know, and they'd sell that to you. Uh, but it seemed more to just be come in and wander around. I didn't feel like they were actively trying to right. recruit you as a missionary or right. An After, agenda. Yeah, they didn't have an agenda for you to come in other than to see it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Of course, I've been perusing all the different social media sites from all the different points of view. And I came across on the most faithful sub. Uh, they were talking about this and asking questions. And several people gave various versions of this idea. Um, I was, you know, in the Kirkland Temple with Kurt, did I say K? Kurt Lynn Temple with my family, and I felt nothing. 
I didn't feel any kind of spirit. This is actually a quote from something I just read. Then I walked down the street to Deseret Book and I was like, whew. So that idea that, you know, now there'll be the spirit in these buildings. When they were under the care of the community of Christ, there was no spirit because they weren't under the care of the Brighamite church. So that's an interesting sentiment, I think. Yeah, evidently it's who owns it that makes the spirit there, not uh, not the place itself. Yeah, but all these buildings are interesting. The Nauvoo house is really interesting. And I know we've seen some posts about that. That is extremely special. If you want to read section 124 of the DNC, it actually had kind of a higher purpose, perhaps prescribed to it um, as far as being almost known as the Nauvoo temple house. And so that's kind of an interesting, interesting location to watch and to see what the church is going to do with that, because it may be more than we think it is if you really delve into its history. But obviously all these buildings have a lot of historical, really important events that happened in the origins of the church. Some good, some not so good, right? And <laughs> there's a lot why... of stories that go with these buildings that yeah. we would be horrified from, but the church doesn't tell you those stories when you yeah. go and visit old Nauvoo. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Old Nauvoo. So we'll see. Maybe we'll have to put together our own tour that you get kind of like a you know, an app and you just, you hear the truth story. I don't know. Um, let's talk about, and I think this is important, what was not purchased because there are some things that the community of Christ still owns that the church did not buy. So um, the Nauvoo Cemetery where Joseph Smith, Emma Smith, and Hiram Smith are buried, um, we confirmed that was not purchased. So that now it could be that the house and the buildings around it were, um, but where the bodies lay that still belongs to the community of Christ. Yeah. I think the community of Christ knows where all the bodies are buried from Mormon history. So yeah, they had that, to keep that. <laughs> that may be true, you know, cause they have a different spin on the history. You know, they, even the way they look at the temple, the things that the Brighamite um, LDS members believe happened there, they don't believe happened there. You know, some of the manifestations and things like that. So they do have a very different take on the history i think and to them it's more personal they've used this building for for over a century you know they have personal experiences and memories so it's different yeah i think it's kind of like the conference uh or the tabernacle was for yeah. most of us growing up and then they built yeah. the the huge uh place across the street but that's doesn't have near the significance the tabernacle did for those growing up at that time period yep Let's talk about something else that wasn't purchased. And I think this is really important. And that is the temple lot and the surrounding temple lot area. Um, the temple lot is really important. Why? <laughs> well, supposedly uh, before Christ's second coming to reign in the millennial, the, this temple on the temple lot in Independence, Missouri was supposed to ha have been built. Um, obviously when the saints uh, had to leave Missouri, uh, they had to leave this temple lot behind. It was acquired by several different organizations. Uh, the temple lot itself is owned by a very small group uh, that most of us have never heard of. Uh, what are they called? The temple yeah, lot? I can, I can read like this that. and then we can go over it. Yeah, but okay. the main significance of this, this uh, whole area here is that once that temple is built, the second coming is right around the corner. So I kind of feel like had they purchased this, everybody would be losing their collective, you know what, right now, right? And running for the hills because that is like the last sign that this is imminent. This is happening. So they didn't purchase that. And I don't know if that's because it was not for sale or they thought, you know what, if we buy this, everybody's going to go berserk, right? Everyone who's looking for signs. So um, I'll just read this really quick. The Community of Christ, formerly the RLDS Church, the second largest church within the modern Latter-day Saint movement, now owns the bulk of the original 63-acre property. This is the temple lot property. Around the temple lot, often referred to as the greater temple lot. This land has been purchased in the 1830s by Latter-day Saint Bishop Edward Partridge to be the central common and sacred era, area, according to the Platte of Zion. It maintains its world headquarters in this area, um, opening its auditorium to the south of the lot in 1958, while in 1994, it dedicated its independence temple just to the east. So the community of Christ has built its temple on the greater temple lot. 
and and they use it. They use the auditorium. They have the temple there. Now, the actual temple lot that we're talking about, the one where the temple is supposed to be erected and Jesus is supposed to return very soon after that, that's a different story. This temple lot is currently owned by the Small Church of Christ, or also known as the Temple Lot, um, which acquired the land in 1867. This organization, this is a different organization from the Community of Christ, made a failed effort in 1929 to build a temple of its own on the property, which represents to date the only attempt to erect such a structure since the time of Joseph Smith. So to me, it's telling that it wasn't purchased, whether it wasn't offered or they just chose not to purchase it. Because I feel once they start constructing a temple there, I feel like everyone's going to run for the hills. Yeah, and this is obviously owned by someone other than the Community of Christ yeah. and the sale was made by them. But the Community of Christ does own land around the uh, yes. temple, but the, they don't own that. So the, the bottom line is the temple lot was not sold and is not purchased. The Kirtland exactly. Temple uh, was purchased. Correct. Neither the greater temple lot nor the temple lot itself um, are in the hands of the LDS church right now. All right, let's go to our, oh, <laughs> and again, we kind of talked about that. Why is the temple lot special? Um, because in DNC 57.3, it says, which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the Western boundaries of the state of Missouri and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, Jr. and others with whom the Lord was well-pleased. So it's extremely special and it means something. Um, all factions of Mormonism believe that this is a sacred place, says G, um, R. Gene Adams, an independent historian. There will be a sacred temple built here before Jesus Christ descends openly to the earth again. Mormons haven't abandoned this hope that at some future time there will be a holy city literally built at this location, um, says Alexander Ba, an associate professor of church history and doctrine at BYU. So again, everybody thinks this is going to happen eventually someday. And I have to say, I'm very proud of this AI I made. Don't you like that? I love this picture. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's really good. Sometimes you, you know, type in the words you want and get something really cool. So sometimes you get, you get nice something picture. freakishly bizarre that you can't use, <laughs> but this one worked. Well, no, and this is, this is awesome because we always hear about the saints returning to Missouri and that that's where the, yeah. you know, to build the temple and yeah. stuff. So. Again, I think a lot of people would have been selling their houses if this was sold. That's not to say that the Temple Lot Church isn't going to need money one day and going to be able to yep. sell it for uh, $300 million. They're pretty adamant. As I understand it, they have said, I will never. And again, this is the group that owns the tiny actual lot. Community of Christ owns the greater Temple Lot around it. But the little group, apparently they've said never. So we'll see. See. We'll see. And and again, the reason that we're talking about this is because prepperism, right? Here we have some pictures. We just have a case where Blaise um, Tribodeau, right, was taken by his mother. They said he was the Davidic servant. The end is near. I mean, there's a lot going on with the, with the signs of the seventh seal. Um, Christ is supposed to come back on April 8th. There's a lot going on this month, right? So <laughs> purchasing yeah. that temple would have really thrown everybody over the edge, I think. Yeah, to buy it right uh, now with the April 8th date yeah. looming, it would be yeah. just uh, too much for some people to handle. They would it be would. Uh, loading up their trailer and moving to the desert. Yeah. So, No, I know a lot of people that they believe in this April 8th date. I think I might have to take the day off work just, just in case. We'll see what happens. All right. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting, this is a little off topic, but I think it's funny. So there was another... I would say kind of major church history location that came up for sale just a couple months ago. And our friend Steve Pinecker um, podcasted about this at length. You can look that up over in his channel, Mormon Book Reviews. Um, but the Mormon cave came up for sale. Now, you guys are probably familiar with the Hill Cumorah. That's what this is a picture of. And why don't you read uh, what Brigham Young said about the Hill Cumorah? When Joseph got the plates, the angel instructed him to carry them back to the hill Cumorah. The hill opened and they walked into a cave in which there was a large and spacious room. They laid the plates on a table. Under this table, there was a pile of plates as much as two feet high. And there were all together in this room more plates than probably many wagon loads. They were piled up in the corners and along the walls. 
Yeah. And I think that's an actual picture of what it looked like right there on the yeah. top, right? <laughs> I think that's it. So we're hearing this about the hill Camorra, which is right there. But did anyone know that there is another hill nearby where you can find what's known as the Mormon cave? And this is, to me, this is an equally relevant church history site. Joseph Smith, another leader, spent time in this cave. Yet the church, for whatever reason, did not choose to buy this. Um, I'll read this very quickly. Joseph Smith's family dug a cave in Miner's Hill. So this is a hill in the vicinity, a couple miles north of Camorra, and installed wooden beams to support the crumbly um, aggregate. It was more or less a copy of Captain Kidd's cave near Albany. Um, this is off a Mormon message board. Somebody named Uncle Dale put this in uh, about a decade ago. Um, what's important to note here is that the treasure diggers would sell their service to others and would be paid to dig into large hills to find the treasure that the seer could watch for from his peepstone in a hat. We're not talking about small holes in a hill here, but caves that are carved out of the sides of hills. Um, here are photographs from the hole in Miner's Hill that was dug during one of Joseph's treasure digging digs. This is LDS discussions. According to some sources, the cave we found was manually dug into the hill by Joseph Smith and or his father in the early 1820s and may have been the setting for some of the Book of Mormon's pre-publication activities from a rational faith. So to me, this is extremely relevant and valid, don't you think? Oh, yeah. This is directly uh, the youth of Joseph Smith, uh, treasure digging, digging into these hills. The church wants to tell you, Oh yes, he 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 did a little gold digging or whatever, make it sound like he was a miner. Uh, but in fact, uh, they would go after treasure that would then sink into the hill, and they never were able to get it. And they charge people to do this, and he'd yeah. look into his hat, the the same hat and the same stone that he used to do the Book of Mormon. He was looking at to dig this cave to trip chase after treasure, and then uh, it's believed by some that uh, the they actually set up a table in there and that mm -hmm. uh, the Book of Mormon manuscript and some of that work was done inside this cave. So that seems like a pretty relevant uh, historical site, but uh, came up for sale and nobody wanted to buy it. No takers. I can just, I'm looking at that picture and I'm just picturing a cute missionary couple going right in here is where Joseph and Oliver sat in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing it. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're going to talk a little. I just love the cave. It's so interesting. So we're not going to read all of these, but there were all kinds of quotes of people talking about the cave. And this is a picture of it from the inside out. I mean, it's pretty massive. So one person says in 1884, again, of course, these are late date recollections, but they're still talking about it. The big hole was dug in the hill. I am one of them that saw the digging. I seen the old man dig there day in and day out. And by then they're talking about Joseph Smith Sr. The cave was situated on the east side of the hill. It was in the summer before Alvin died. He told it at our house. Uh, this digging was a mile from Smith's. Don't know if there was ever anything in the cave. And the cave was on our place. So it sounds like Joseph Smith Sr., according to this man, um, did a lot of digging in it. And again, they just kind of go through and they describe it. And one person says, just beyond the chase well, that's a well where they got the stone from, isn't it? One of the serious yeah, stones? Yeah. yeah, exactly. From the chase well, a quarter of a mile or so is the minor farm on which is shown a cave or excavation that was used by Smith and his close followers while engaged in deciphering the golden plates. It was originally boarded in, but it is dilapidated condition at present. So this person says they went inside and they were actually doing translation inside the cave. So if you want to pause the slide, you can read some other statements about it, but it's an important site. And yet again, the church didn't want to take this and restore it and give us any information about it at all. <laughs> Which again goes back to my statement, the church did not buy the Kirtland Temple, they bought the narrative. Yeah. They didn't buy this cave because they didn't want this narrative. Yeah. It's as historical as the, uh, maybe not quite as historical as the Kirtland Temple, but certainly as historical as some of the documents and some yeah. of the artifacts that they had. And they had the chance to purchase it and they wanted nothing yeah. to do with it. Yep. Yeah. I think we have one more slide. 
Nope. I think we're done with the cave. So anyway, look into this. If you guys want to Google it, it's really interesting. It really is. And I, I, I know that on Steve Pinecrest's program, they had had a buyer. I'm not sure who ended up buying it or who owns it, but I know it's not the church. So um, let's talk just a little bit about the Kirtland temple itself. What is its actual history? Again, I feel like a lot of people don't really know. I mean, it hasn't been in the church's hands. It's covered a little bit, but I, I'm not sure everybody knows. Do you want to read that, Landon? Beginning in 1831, members of the Church of Christ, that's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that's the original name, yeah. uh, under the direction of church founder Joseph Smith, began to gather in the Kirtland area. In December 1832, Smith stated he received a revelation that called for the construction of a house of worship, education, and order on May 6, 1833, Smith stated he had received a revelation from God directing members of the church to construct a house fully dedicated unto the Lord for the work of the presidency, dedicated unto the Lord from the foundation thereof, according to the order of the priesthood. Yeah, and that's um, according to Leonard Arrington, church, uh, um, church historian in the economic history of the Latter-day Saint movement. Um, the temple cost forty thousand dollars to construct. That's quite an investment, forty thousand yeah. to one hundred ninety million. Uh, That's now, what he said. I guess they got some other stuff for that, but we know that just for the uh, temple that the one group was bidding a hundred million dollars. So yeah, uh, that's quite a growth. That is quite a growth. And again, all the saints were gathering here and Joseph is getting a revelation. Again, I made this with AI. I love it. I think Joseph looks pretty accurate, but the people in the audience, I didn't even tell it to like put the looks on their faces. Look at their faces. They're all like shocked. What? A temple? So <laughs> anyway, this was supposed to be Joseph announcing the revelation to begin construction on the temple. So let's continue with the history of the Kirtland temple. So this is really interesting. How many of you knew that the Kirtland Temple was not originally white on the exterior as it is today. The original exterior was a bluish gray, according to Truman Co., a local minister in the 1830s. The roof is believed to have been red, and the front door is olive green. Uh, presently, only the doors are the original color. And I could not find any representation of that, so I actually found it was a Lego competition of temples, and a very skilled Lego designer, Mark Clark, uh, designed this. So that kind of shows what it would have looked like. Kind of a, uh, I don't know, kind of a tannish bluish gray and the red and the green. And I wonder, do you think that the church will restore it to its original colors now that it owns it? Uh, no, because I don't think they can light it up at night and be seen for a oh, thousand miles. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're right. Yeah. No, a red roof and a green. Yeah, you're right. It's going to have to be white, but interesting to see. It helps me picture kind of, it looks more homey like that, you know, like a meeting hall and a place of gathering. To me, it looks more homey. So interesting. All right. Let's look at our next slide. Okay. On with the history. The temple was dedicated in a seven-hour service on March 27, 1836. As reported, 1,000 persons attended the gathering, which introduced such traditional de dedication rites as the Hosanna Shout. Yeah. And I have there a picture of the last time we saw the Hosanna Shout in public. It was at conference. Um, you can see Elder Oaks there. And if we could see the next frame, he suddenly gets off with his hanky waving. It was kind of a funny moment, a cute moment. Um, but the Hosanna shout is, you know, a special, I don't know, tribute, you know, and, and there's certain words that you say with it. I think it was performed a little differently in this temple. As I understand it, they were stomping their feet. They were waving their handkerchiefs. It was a lot more passionate maybe than what we saw. And when we saw it performed at general conference and we did it in our homes, you know, where you just kind of wave a Kleenex around. So, so the Hosanna shout happened also singing of the hymn um, written by W.W. Phelps entitled the spirit of God, like a fire is burning. Okay. That's everybody's okay. favorite, right? Uh, everybody's favorite. Yep. Uh, following a two and a half hour sermon given by church leader, Sidney Rigdon, because we all know that Sidney Rigdon loved to exhort, right? He was a very famous, impassioned exhorter. Um, and then let's see, Smith offered a dedicatory prayer that had been prepared by a committee of church leaders, um, which he indicated was given to him by revelation. So a prayer from God. And then two other church leaders, Brigham Young and David W. Patton, were reported to have been inspired to speak in tongues. 
You don't see that very often. No, um, we don't. After the prayer, you do not see that. Not anymore. It was very common in the early church. Now we look common. at it as a freakish uh, yeah. type thing when people speak in tongues. You don't do that. But also there were just, if I remember correctly, just miracles and spiritual experiences and visions. It was just this supercharged spiritual day spent there. Do you remember reading stories like that? Yeah, that's what you are taught. You know, the the spirit rushed into the building and through right. the windows and you could hear it as a rushing wind and yeah. everyone reported uh, all of the great things that happened that day in the in the temple. Yeah. And again, our pictures, the middle is uh, Sydney Rigdon. And of course, at the end is our favorite Brigham Young, who looks like he's just about to burst into speaking in tongues. Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. So yeah, a very special day, a very spiritual day um, as recorded in the church narrative. Um, so interestingly, there are some other accounts of that day. Um, there is an apostle, William McClellan. Uh, would you like to read some of his um, recounts of this? Of course, these are late you know, additions to it in, in the later 1800s, but he had a different recollection of what actually happened that day in the temple. Apostle William E. McClellan said that no spiritual manifestations occurred at the Kirtland Temple dedication. McClellan contends that some of the Mormon men were not visionary, but drunk, having imbibed <laughs> too much wine on empty stomachs following a fast. April 1854, uh, Orson, uh, these are all said, by Apostle McClellan, is, but yes. he's just going to go through and say it. Yeah. Yep. April 1854. Orson, you cannot have forgotten the scenes of drunkenness during the pretended endowment, uh, endowment I think, yeah. uh, in Kirtland in 1836. I shall never forget them, nor the hundreds of false prophecies delivered in the temple on that occasion. Apostle William E. McClellan. Uh, huh. In October 1871, he said, as to the endowment in Kirtland, I state positively it was no endowment from God. Not only myself was not endowed, but no other man of the 500 who was present, except it was with wine. Uh, and that's again, endowed possible. with wine. Oh, that's yeah. funny. These are actually taken from Fair Mormon. I forgot to put the attribution on it. So. And then this one, um, again, with the dedication. And again, I had fun with AI, right? You see them all sitting there and they've got their spirits. So this is also by Apostle McClellan. This is another um, statement in 1872. He says, in 1836, when they undertook to get an endowment in the Kirtland Temple, all washed and with oil anointed themselves and appeared in the temple at sunrise. And about 500 ministers took their places and solemnly prayed. We remained there fasting until sunrise the next morning. We, however, partook of some bread and wine in the evening, and some partook so freely on their empty stomachs, that will do it, that they became drunk. I took care of Samuel H. Smith, that is Joseph's brother, in one of the stands, so deeply intoxicated that he could not, nor did sense anything. I kept him hid from the crowd in the stand, but he vomited the spit box five times full, and his dear brother, Don Carlos, also Joseph Smith's brother, would empty it out of the window. So very different memories. Again, this is from Fair Mormon. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like... Uh... Quite the temple endowment, yeah. <laughs> drunkenness, puking, throwing it out the window, uh, trying to hide it from everybody. So. Do you know what? Sometimes your moments of enlightenment, though, maybe come in that situation. So <laughs> not that I know, but maybe I'm maybe. not sure. So anyway, say. a different use for the Kirtland Temple um, as they're dedicating it. All right, let's move on. So um, let's talk about the important events that happened in the Kirtland Temple, because there's a reason that the church was so eager to purchase this temple. There were, were some major events purported to have happened. And I will say that the community of Christ doesn't really support that these events happened. Um, it doesn't follow their narrative, but the mainstream LDS church, the Brighamite branch, they believe these events happened in the temple. Do you want to read that, Landon? And this is again from the Tribune. Latter-day Saints believe it was within its walls that on April 3rd, 1836, Jesus appeared alongside the biblical prophets Moses, Elijah, and Elias to Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and in addition to inaugurating the gathering of Israel, conferred on them the power necessary for sealing couples in marriage for eternity. 
And I don't know if it was just couples or if it was uh, polygamous marriages, because we know that that all happened in, yeah. uh, uh, well, in the Nauvoo time period is when we get the revelation about that. So it's, uh, you know, kind of weird that he provided the ceiling, uh, but uh, then polygamy comes later. But he's actually marrying polygamous wives in Kirtland. So, yeah. Yep, it was all happening. And again, there's a little bit of a confusion or controversy about Elijah and Elias that a lot of people have talked about. Do you want to <laughs> explain that a little bit? Well, they're the same person. So they are the same person. They, they saw the same person twice, evidently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they seem to not know they're the same person. So, yeah. well, maybe it's like a nickname. Maybe if like somebody were, were to say, I saw Rebecca and Becky, right? Not that I go by Becky, please yes. don't call me that, but maybe it was like that, but it does seem to be confusing or confusion on their part. Um, Elijah and Elias are used interchangeably, yet here they are, seem to be used as two persons, personages. So, but the important part is that Jesus appeared and talked about the gathering of Israel and brought back some of the sealing keys. Um, here's a question, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, this amazing temple, this revelation, people sacrificing to build it, the saints have gathered. Why did they leave? You know, and I feel like if you were to ask one of the new missionary guides, do you think they would tell you the answer? They might say something about, uh, you know, that he had to leave, but I, I don't know that they'll tell you this story, the story fully. Yeah, they, they always seem to have a way to twist it, uh, you know, just right. Yep. Do you want to read that, Landon? Why was the Kirtland Temple abandoned? Smith's time in Kirtland after the temple came into use was limited. In 1837, he became involved with the foundation of a bank known as the Kirtland Safety Society. The failure of this bank was a factor that caused a schism among Latter-day Saints in Kirtland. The dissenters were led by Warren Parrish, Smith's former secretary, and included Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Parish's group took control of the temple and other church property by the beginning of 1838. Smith was forced to flee the state, relocating to far west Missouri with hundreds of loyalists after the Mormons moved west in 1838. The temple was used by the Western Reserve Teachers Seminary. Parish's group dissolved, and by 1841, the remaining Latter-day Saints in Kirtland had come back into communion with the main body of the church, which had subsequently relocated to Nauvoo, Illinois. Exactly. So if you want to know more about the uh, Kirtland Safety Society, we have a couple episodes on that, don't we, Landon? But it was a hot mess, let's say that. And everybody lost their money and everybody blamed Joseph Smith and he had to get out of Dodge very quickly. And well, if you remember, uh, one of the reasons they were creating all this money was so that they could fund the temple yep. uh, yep. and and pay it off. And they were basically stealing uh, money by falsely printing currency that had yep. more value than what they had backing in it. And we hear stories of Joseph Smith uh, taking and putting gold on top of sand yep. to make it look like he had large reserves of gold, which he really did not have. Uh, and as a result, uh, he was chased out and, and had to flee. He was actually caught and uh, charged and found guilty of this. And they had to pay each a thousand dollar fine uh, yeah. to, to get out of the state. Yeah, that's right. And it did cause a huge schism. A lot of people had a big problem. A lot of people left. A lot of people almost left like Carly P. Pratt. It was it was a very uh, disappointing era and and very problematic. So let's go to our next slide. And and as you can see, a lot of people then uh, took control of the temple. Who did it belong to? Um, you know, who who had stewardship over over it? Um, we'll talk about how the community of Christ finally owned it. Um, a period of confusion followed Smith's death. So in 1844, he's been martyred as rival leaders and factions vied for control of the temple. In 1845, the Latter Day Saints in Kirtland, under the leadership of S.B. Stoddard, Leonard Rich, and Jacob Bump organized their own church in opposition to those of Brigham Young, James Strang, and other leaders. So, of course, this is the succession crisis. Everybody's saying, follow me, come follow me. And there are some saints in Kirtland that are there with the temple that are saying, hey, no, come over here. Um, Let's see. Where those? Okay, those are Brigham Young, James Strang, and other leaders. 
This group later merged with a faction led by William McClellan, the one who told us about what really happened at the dedication, whose president was David Whitmer. That's a familiar name, one of the three witnesses. So everybody had some claim on leadership there. By 1848, another Latter-day Saint faction led by Hazen Aldrich and James Cullen Brewster was organized in Kirtland and maintained control of the temple. This faction also dissolved. Are you seeing a pattern here? Yes. <laughs> And most of the members who were in Kirtland eventually joined the Community of Christ, then known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, adding the word reorganized to their name in 1872. So this, of course, is the church that Emma and Joseph's son, Joseph Smith III, became a prophet. And so he's also vying for, for control. Everybody says they have a legitimate claim. Um, led by Joseph Smith III. In 1860, a probate court in Ohio sold the Kirtland Temple as a means of paying off some debts owed by Joseph Smith's estate. Joseph Smith III and Mark Hill um, Forscat purchased a quick claim deed to the temple in 1874. So eventually, through this very long and twisted path of different factions of the Restoration, um, eventually the Community of Christ owned the Kirtland Temple and for over a, well over a century. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a story that uh, yeah. this temple keeps getting. Uh, it, it seems that if you own the temple, uh, you soon become a, 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 a disorganized faction that fades into, uh, you know, fades from memory. So right. uh, I think that that may end up being the fate of the Church of Christ uh, as they sell this off. That they may fade into that same uh, same. Okay. Oh, I hope not. I don't think the community of Christ is going anywhere, but I think it will morph. I think it will change. That's for sure. And this is a huge step, which may be by design. I don't know. We'll see. All right, well, let's go to our next I, slide. I then think the LDS church will fade into the same thing, but it'll be uh, <laughs> probably with their hundred billions, it may be a hundred or yeah. more years before you that don't happened. fade away when you have that kind of a portfolio even if the the religious arm of the church which is in the articles of incorporation that there is a religious arm even if it goes away the corporation remains there's no stopping that that's for sure okay so a couple interesting facts around the kirtland temple i thought this was really good do you want to read some of these landon the Kirtland Temple was granted to the rlds in 1880 by an ohio court the lds church did not dispute uh, this or counter sue. So that's was, interesting, isn't that? Yeah. yeah so usually, at that same, yeah, we just read that. And, and this is 1880 before I think it said 1878 or six. But the point is the Brighamite branch didn't try to get the temple. Well, it said they didn't uh, counter sue, which means Kurt McConkie was not in <laughs> existence at this time. It was just curtain. It wasn't McConkie yet. So there was yeah. just there was just the one of them. But yeah, they didn't dispute it or they didn't counter sue. They didn't say, no, that's our founding temple. That's for us. Of course, they were out west dealing with other problems. But yes, uh, they were dealing with trying to get statehood and get, uh, pretend yeah. that polygamy wasn't and happening. The, mani yeah. the manifesto, that's right. <laughs> Hiram Smith had declared Kirtland to be a cursed land in a letter sent to the city to call church members in Nauvoo. So, of course, because Joseph Smith was driven out and the members are still all there going, well, this is my home. So Hiram has to write a letter and says, oh, no, did we say a blessed place? No, it's cursed. You need to move. You need move to now to move over to Nauvoo. Yeah. <laughs> Those poor saints, they're like, wait, what? Where am I supposed to go? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. They, they never really unpacked because they were place to place and then finally out west. Kirtland was long used by the RLDS Church for worship services, community events, pageants, and church reunions. Artifacts from these events regularly unearthed after rainstorms all over the grounds. Tourisms didn't take a priority until the 1950s and 60s. Yeah, and I think that's part of it. I mean, the LDS Church looks at this as a historic place of note, but the Community of Christ, it's where they had exactly what it said. It has actual personal memories and, and that's different. That's I think why they're so attached. It's a different meaning. Tours of the temple have always cost money. They've been offered since the opening of the temple and the fee has always been considered minimal. It was written into the rules of conduct by Joseph Smith. Of so even Joseph is. used to charge people to that's get That's right. 
Well, he would, you know, they would charge to see the mummies that were up in Lucy's uh, bedroom, right? They're going to charge for everything. Yeah, they've always been, uh, yeah, so find a way. But now uh, it's interesting that the, one of the conditions of the purchase is that it had to be uh, free. Yeah. And I think that is from the community of Christ so that they have access to the building still, that their members will have access. But uh, you know the church will eventually find a way to uh, limit uh, that access. So maybe they can take a tour, but eventually they'll find a way to limit it to members only as they yep. always do. members only well it is their building now and that was kind of another tip off that it was being sold or it was in the works because weeks before um there was a religious leader that was supposed to be making an address in the kirtland temple he had permission to do it it was going to be really important having to do with you know what was happening with the eclipse and april 8th and then suddenly he was told you can't so i feel like you know it was kind of in the works, you know, when the church was starting to take over and saying, no, you got to cancel any events. You, you know, we have to lock this down. You know, it's now going to be in our possession. So kind of interesting. All right, let's see what else. Um, and again, these facts are from a wonderful book called Kirtland Temple, the biography of a shared Mormon sacred space by David Hallett. And we're going to have another quote by him later on. Um, the LDS cultural interest in Kirtland dates to the late 1860s and 70s during the advent of the new Mormon history and the popularity of road trips. By the efforts of one independent historian, Carl Anderson, the LDS church started to take an interest in buying properties and build revenue through tourism. So that's a rel relatively new phenomenon. Let's go to Nauvoo, right? I wasn't kidding about the Eliza or snow cone. There is an element of truth to that, isn't there? That's right. Uh, and and that you said 1860s, it's 1960s. So oh, it was did quite, I? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm quite sorry. late okay. uh, before they started doing that. Yeah. Yeah. There weren't too many road trips in 1860. <laughs> if it was a road trip, it was a wagon taking you to your new home, right? All right. Let's see. A woman. Yeah. And there was this rumor women sacrificed their China. There, that rumor is in the Salt Lake Temple, too. Huh? Women didn't sacrifice their fine China to make the plaster sparkle. They sent small children out to gather broken pottery from rubbish piles to break up and add in. So they did try to make it nice. They did try to decorate it, but it wasn't as dramatic as smashing your dinner plates to put in the temple. I think we all heard that story growing yeah. up, how they were yeah. crushing their finest China to put it yeah. in. And make it sparkle, which again, um, it wasn't white and sparkly. It was more of that bluish gray color. <laughs> so yeah, that is true. Uh, the next one has to do with what I talked about before. This is above the door of the Kirtland Temple, House of the Lord, built by the Church of the Latter-day Saints in 1834. So at that point, it was called the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Um, and this little... This mentions the Kirtland Temple was dedicated during the brief period when Jesus stripped his name from the church. Forget what the Book of Mormon says and how be it my church, save it be called by my name. That's third Nephi. The name of the temple is the Church of the Latter-day Saints with no hyphen. This name change was made partly to throw off creditors in New York who were still trying to collect debts incurred by what they were formerly called and first called Church of Christ. That's kind of smart. I like that. That's kind of funny. You throw Christ under the bus when you owe money, evidently. <laughs> when the chips are down, you have to throw them under the bus. That's right. All right. Let's go to our next slide. Okay. So this is something we definitely want to talk about, and that is the reactions to the sale. And for those of you that are listening, we have a graphic of people cheering and putting their fists in the air, standing in front of the temple. And on the other side, we have people that just look absolutely devastated. And we've seen both of these types of reactions in the last few days, haven't we landed? Yep. We, uh, you know, if you're a TBM, this is proof the church is true that yeah. they have a huge enough fund that they can purchase any property they want. And if you're the RLDS or the community of Christ, this is their now called, you're very disappointed uh, that the heritage uh, that made you peculiar and who you were has just been sold out from under you. That's right. And again, I feel like a lot of people did not know. That's kind of the word on the street that I'm getting that a lot of people, even some in higher up positions in the church had no idea that this was going to happen. And, and again, it may be that their, their hand was kind of forced to announce early 
because, you know, some other people broke it. You know, maybe it was supposed to be rolled out, a soft rollout slowly, and they were just kind of forced to make that joint announcement. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know, but there was definitely some gloating going on on one side and some yep. uh, sheer horror from another side. Yep. Yep, it's very polarized. And then a lot of people in the middle trying to educate. And I've tried to do this a little bit. When I've been on sites, uh, there are a couple of websites or YouTube channels I won't name where they're literally cheering, hurrah to Israel. We've got it back. It's ours, you know. And I tried to go on there and say, look, don't be so tone deaf. You know, this is this is very devastating. You know, this is the end of an era for some people. And, you know, of course you can you can be excited, I guess, but, you know, have some have some feelings about this and understand how other people are are reacting. Aren't they persecuting the community of Christ? Uh, if if they were saying that to the Mormons, uh, uh, they would be claiming that they're being persecuted. Yeah. No, just everybody needs to you know just take a step back, try to imagine how everyone else feels, and you know just just let it play out because there's a lot of there's a lot of really devastated feelings out there, I'll say. So I found a quote. There were so many different quotes that are everywhere. You guys, of course, can research and Google this, but I found Richard Bushman and this was in the Tribune. Um, he, of course, wrote Rough Stone Rolling and historian Richard Bushman, the author of the acclaimed biography, Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling, applauded the sale while acknowledging the likely mixed feelings of some within the community of Christ. So he's also trying to educate and help heal. Um, it's been an icon of their faith, along with their temple in independence and connection to Joseph Smith for so long, he said. But it's not like it's being turned into a bank. It will still be a historic <laughs> Latter-day Saint building and open to the public. I just found that kind of ironic, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the biggest banks in the, in the world at this point. Uh, yeah. And it's funny that he picks bank when the reason it had to be left was because they'd opened a bank. <laughs> because of a bank. And the reason it's able to be purchased now is because the church, at least the Ensign Peak Arm, is like a bank, right? They can just plop down cash for any, I mean, no one can outbid them. We learned that when Bill Gates was trying to outbid them for some land in Washington, I think, or mm -hmm. Oregon. I think it was Washington. Yeah. Nobody can outbid them at all. Um, anyway, Richard Bushman goes on. He added that he believed his fellow Latter-day Saints will be good stewards of the sacred site. We will honor it and make it available. He said, adding that it is one more indication of the kinship between our two traditions that we can share this beautiful and significant building. And I hope that's right. I think that's a good way to look at it. I hope that's right. I hope the church will be a good steward and will respect that narrative of the community of Christ, because otherwise it's lost. They have a different view of history. You know, Brigham and his group left. Community of Christ, RLDS, they were there. That's why they have the artifacts in the first place. They resided there. They lived there. They worshiped there for over a century. And that's Emma's church. That's Joseph Smith III's church. And there is a heritage and a narrative that's very different from those that came to Utah. I don't believe this for a minute. Uh, I, I think I think the church will be a good steward because that's what they do with these properties uh, right. to show them off and use them to convince their members uh, that the church is true. Uh, but I uh, this this indication of the kinship between our tr two traditions. When has the church ever been friendly to what they consider an apostate group? The only reason they're friendly with this group is because they've owned these properties and they wanted to have access to them. And now that they're now that they don't own the properties, they're no different than any other apostate group like the FLDS. The uh, to me, I think they've lost. Uh, I, I don't. I don't see that kinship continuing for very long. It will. It will initially, but it'll fade over time because the church doesn't need them anymore. And as soon as the church doesn't need you, they get rid of you. Well, they still have the greater temple lot. So Christ can't no, come back no, no, until they, they build the, that. The temple lot church has the temple lot. Right, so. but I said the greater temple lot. The greater lot. temple lot. They'll have yes. all that. And, and maybe, so, and they have the bodies. And uh, they have the graves. So they, they so, still have to engage yeah. with them, but they've, they've lost a lot of clout uh, in being able to uh, be at the table here. Yeah, that may be true. All right, let's look at, I think this is one last quote, and this is by the author of the book that had the interesting facts. And this is David Howlett, a Community of Christ historian 
who wrote a book about the Kirtland Temple, said the news has provoked a lot of deep sadness for me personally. And I think a lot of people feel that way. The appearance of Jesus and the prophets is not part of his faith's tradition. See, and that's what I was trying to say. They don't, they don't subscribe to that idea that what the Brighamite church says happened there happened. By contrast, he said that for him and many other members of the Missouri-based faith, the building's important is less historical and more personal. And that's what we were trying to say. They actually have experiences. Their people lived with the building, the mainstream LDS church. They didn't live with the building anymore. They moved, you know, they moved away. Yeah, simply a historical site for- Yep, simply a historical site. That's exactly right. So- You can see that in the different reactions of people. So again, it's a very pretty building. We have just a slide up that says final thoughts. Um, It is a very beautiful building. I've never been. I think maybe Mormonish needs to take a tour. What do you think? Should we take a trip, a road trip? (laughs) I kind of like never went on purpose. I just didn't know if I could, you know what I mean? I mean, is it difficult when you, when you go to those sites to be able to well, I was, a, I was an active member oh, when I okay. went to those sites. Okay. So, you know, I bought the whole Kool-Aid and okay. all the cute things they did. And yeah. the church, you know, they they distract you from the historical part. But I remember a big opening in my faith crisis came when I visited Nauvoo because of the Emma Smith. I kept scratching my head going, why didn't Emma Smith go with the rest of them? I thought they were sealed, and I keep, I'm taught that Joseph and Emma will be in heaven together, but she's an apostate. So how can that be? Uh, his whole family's apostate. What's going on here? That really confused me. And I think that uh, these historical sites can be confusing. Right. Uh, so what they try to do is really bolster it up for the believing members to make it faith-promoting. Uh, but there's always the hints of the truth come out and it makes people start reading or questioning and researching. And all of a sudden they say, what happened here? Uh-huh. And so it can be just as dangerous as well. And that's why the church was willing to spend this kind of money. They bought a narrative or they bought the rights to tell the narrative at these locations. Yeah, I think you're right. Because I think about all the church historic sites we have gone to. We spent a lot of time at the church museum. We've gone to Mountain Meadows multiple times. We were just there last weekend. We've gone to the Willie and Martin Handcart sites. And it's true. They definitely spin a faith promoting story. And, but it does leave you kind of wondering, well, there, I think there might be something else to it, you know? And, and I don't think it's just people that maybe are post-Mormons. I mean, I've been at Mountain Meadows where never Mormons walk in and they read the signage and they say, now what happened here? What is this? You know, there's just something not quite clear that leaves you questioning and, and maybe hoping, hope, hopefully looking into it a little bit more because the real history is really interesting. Don't you find Oh, yeah, there is some uh, incredibly strange stories that happened yeah. at all of these sites. Yeah. Uh, and it's 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 interesting uh, that, you know, we always look for Book of Mormon historicity. But uh, uh, what do we find here? Uh, when you start looking, uh, I don't think they should call them church historical sites. They should call them church narrative sites. It's the place where they tell the narrative that they want you to hear. They don't necessarily tell you the history that is true. Yep. I think that's true. In fact, I was going back and forth forth with RFM today and he said, let's see, history is their religion. I'm talking about the church. And I said, and also religion is their history. And I think both, both is true when it comes to this. It's really interesting. So, well, I think we covered it. Do you think we left anything out? There was a lot to cover. There's so oh, much. I'm sure we left plenty out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We did. And everybody's podcasting. I look online. I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody has done a podcast about this. But I definitely wanted to look into more like what didn't they buy? And, you know, what are some of the more little known historical stories or facts about the temple and and pull out a few things that were a little bit different, I thought. So So I think it was good. And, and there's so much more to learn about it. And there's so much, this is like a breaking story ongoing. Almost every day we're learning more about what the sale means and what the intentions are and and even what the community of Christ is, is doing going forward. There's a lot online about that. And they have some really wonderful goals um, and missions that they want to accomplish with uh, the money now. And so we wish them, of course, all the best. And we are just going to be waiting and, and watching, wouldn't you say? 
Yeah. I, what do you think? This cell hurt, hurts them or helps them? Yeah. Let's, let's comment on that because I don't know. I mean, they're calling it a decision for the future. And if they truly are trying to distance themselves from this narrative, then, you know, it's the best decision because now they are financially solvent and they have a lot of ways that they can help people. They have a lot of resources. So I'm hoping that's how, how we can look at it. I know the members that we do know uh, of the, yeah. the community of Christ that we've talked to are extremely disappointed. Yeah. And we've even heard talk of people leaving because of this. So we have um, actually, I've read some posts from people that say, that's it. I'm, you know, that's not what I joined for. You've thrown everything away and I'm leaving. We have heard some reports of this. So like I said, this is a wait and watch situation. It's I think unfolding as we're watching it right now. Yep. Yeah, we'll see. Yep, we'll see. So please comment. Let us know what you think about this situation. Um, what have you heard? What have you seen? What are your thoughts? I mean, it really is supercharged. And again, there are new things coming out. By the time we air this podcast tomorrow, there'll probably be, <laughs> who knows what will happen? More news. We can never be as cutting edge as other people that go live, right? <laughs> but we're trying. We stay up late to do it. So anyway, uh, please like and subscribe to More Minish Podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware of new episodes that are coming out, you can hit the notification bell. You can always financially help support the podcast. We have links to Venmo and PayPal, and you can go to mormonishpodcast.org. And we really appreciate everybody that does help out financially. We just absolutely could not do it without your help and support. And we're so thankful to all of you. So until next time, thank you so much from Mormonish. Bye everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.